August 19th, 2021, Leadville, Colorado. This is the Tabor Opera House. I'm about to take a tour. Glad that you chose to come here. It probably is the quietest place in town right now. <laughs> it's pretty chaotic out there. Um, we do have restrooms in the theater. That's a good part of the tour when you're traveling. Since you do have such a big group, we have three tour guides on duty to today. And um, the two youngsters that you just saw, they'll be talking to you down here in the museum and in the theater. And I'll be helping with everything else. And we do have full-on construction right now. And we're trying to keep you away from all those doors where a window or a, a brick or whatever might come flying out of. But we, we know where those parts are and we'll, we'll steer you away from there. But you see we are having a facelift. Um, I call it a multi-level awning with a tunnel. But we are right in the middle of, well not quite in the middle, but we're about $2 million into a $15 million rehab project. It's a biggie and it's all through uh, grant funds and donations, of course, but, you know, the big money's through the, the grant people, uh, National Forest Service, National Parks, DOLA, and we have a, a large board behind the scenes that are all volunteers trying to get these grant funds and follow all the rules and all the expiration dates and everything. And um, also on the tour, I do want to tell you that there are 112 steps they're not all at the same time, but it is a theater, so there's plenty of places to sit, too. And we have a good sturdy banister. I've been using it for 18 years, and I've had both knees replaced. So, you'll be fine, and we'll take care of you. Are you a, really a table? My husband is. I'm just an outlaw. Are you guys ready for the joke? I have a joke that goes with that. Well, they originally came over from England in 1600s as ER. So I have a joke there, if they're making fun of me, I know they are. <laughs> so do you know the difference between in-laws and outlaws? Because my husband's the relative, I'm the outlaw. Outlaws are wanted. <laughs> Shall we go? <laughs> So here we've got a chandelier that started life as a gas chandelier and was converted to electricity at some point. That's kind of neat. Wow, this is neat. See how long this is neat. So I didn't want to waste battery on recording the entire spiel, but 
opening night here was a bit of a flop because they were, they were competing with a double hanging across the street and the double hanging stole their audience. Stonecutter, where his boss was Augusta Pierce's father, Augusta being his future first wife. The two met, fell in love, and decided to move out west uh, like many people did in the mid-1800s. And they made some stops in Kansas uh, where Horace wanted to try his luck with some political aspirations as well as some farming and mining, but nothing really took off. And while in Kansas, Augusta and Horace had their one son named Max Tabor, uh, who later traveled out with them, and they eventually stopped in Leadville, uh, where they were right on time as we were going through a bit of a gold rush in the 1860s and then a silver rush shortly after in the 1870s. Uh, so Horace and Augusta uh, were able to set up their own little house, stationed where we are today. Um, but when he built the opera house, he moved the house over to Fifth Street, where it still stands as a uh, historical monument and place you can do. Uh, there's a picture of that house on this back board at the very bottom left you can take a look at. And just outside of that, they have a small general store where they can uh, profit off some of the mining here and drug state miners. We have a small recreation of that general store just in this room here. You're welcome to go in and check out. Uh, that general store is where Boris was able to accidentally make his first million dollars by grub staking some miners. Two German prospectors stopped by that didn't have quite enough uh, American currency to buy anything from the general store for their mine. Uh, so they owned a little Pittsburgh mine on the east side and were able to strike a deal with Boris Tabor. Boris gave them about $60 worth of equipment. And a few weeks later, all uh, those two prospectors brought back about $3 million worth of silver. And so they struck a little deal. Horace got about $1 million and was able to start up a mining company off of that. At his peak, he was worth about $26 million, which would be about half a billion today. And so with that, he was off. He was pre uh, feeling pretty grateful to Leadville. He built banks here just to hold his money, um, established the first courthouse here, gave Leadville its name. Uh, put the firehouse, the post office, and served as the first postmaster. And when he gave Leadville's name, I always tell this story because it irritates me a little bit. I don't quite like it. Um, it said that he went for a walk and uh, decided to find well, where he went for a walk. He found a small piece of lead and thought Leadville would be a good name. Uh, but Leadville already had lots of different nicknames like Cloud City, Oro City, and Magic City. And in my opinion, those names sound a little cooler, so I wish he went with one of those. Uh, but either way, he decided to give Leadville its name and give him some high-class entertainment, uh, so he moved his house over to Fifth Street and was able to build and spend quite a lot of money on this opera house here. The floor he's standing on is where he lived. Um, it was a bit of a five-room suite and office area. His office was just beyond the walls next to the big window. That way he could look out and see all of Leadville. And as he got richer, he decided to get back into those political aspirations and served as the senator of Colorado for only about a month or so, filling out uh, Senator Teller's term because people heard of this two-year-long affair he was having with a woman 20 years younger than him uh, who was recently divorced from Central City. And so that caught on to lots of people. Lots of people began to hear about it. And nobody quite wanted that to represent Colorado. Um, that lady's name was Baby Doe recently divorced from Central City, and of course, uh, Horace's first wife heard about the divorce, and of course they had to, or they heard about the affair, and so they had to get a divorce, of course. Um, so they tried once here in Leadville, it wasn't quite legal, so they moved out west and found another courthouse where it was legal, so it took two tries to divorce her, and just two months after that they decided to have a wedding with him and his new wife at the Willard Hotel in Washington, D.C., there's a picture on that board of it all. They spent $7,000 on a wedding dress and $90,000 on a diamond necklace. It's rumored that the diamonds in that diamond necklace belonged to Queen Isabella of Spain way back in the 1400s, and that she sold those diamonds in order to give money to Christopher Columbus to uh, pawn her fund his voyage. Um, although I've heard that rumor isn't exactly true, so take it as you will. Um, <laughs>
down at the ticket, um, the box office, and then you can come up and enjoy the show. And so the tickets got more expensive the closer you would get to the stage. So these were the cheapest seats in the house back here, though I would say they're some of the best seats in the house. And so these benches are where the coal miners would reportedly sit for some of the performances. And so these were the only tickets that they could afford, plus back here, they wouldn't get our nice chairs very dirty. Um, so up here, these Andrews had hit off our chairs. They still have their original velvet on them, as well as their original horsehair stuffing. Um, and so they have remained relatively untouched up here throughout the decades, and so they're preserved very, very well. Um, each of them can also be folded up to allow for um, better uh, entry in and out of the aisles. And they also have a, a wire hat rack at the bottom of each of them so that the men can take their top hats off and put them at the bottom of their chair to enjoy the show. Um, yeah. This is our projection booth. It is our newest attraction here at the Opera House. We've recently cleaned it up and set up the Magic Lantern up there. And so once again, from the museum room, the Magic Lantern was the projection apparatus that they would use to project movies and narrative songs onto the stage, mostly during the Elks period. Um, and so right over there is a portrait of Horace Tabor, so that is what the man, the myth, and the legend look like. And that portrait was actually made for his other opera house that he had built in Denver. So he had a second opera house up there by the name of the Tabor Grand, and it was much bigger than this one by around three times, and it had a lot of artwork decorating the theater. And so once it was demolished in the 1970s, so fairly recently, um, they were able to bring up a lot of the artwork and bring it to this opera house. So that's where that portrait came from, and that's also where the paintings of the mine came from that were in the second floor museum room. Um, so a lot of the art came from the Tabor Grand during the time. So the reason why the ceiling looks the, the way that it does is because it's made out of canvas, and that's for acoustic purposes. And so the sound in here is excellent, and for that reason, our opera performers today, as well as back then, have never used microphones. And so whenever we have an opera singer, they remain true to the tradition of just bouncing it out and letting the acoustics sort of speak for themselves. Um, and so once again, this place was built without the help of electricity, and so it was also built in the shape of the speaker to further bring the sound back to the audience. Um, if you guys would like to wander around up here and take some pictures, you may. Please be careful of the railing on the edge of the balcony, as it is quite low, the board is shorter back then, I suppose. And also, please try to avoid the area down there that is decorated with ladders and, and new doors and things. Um, we are working on the fire seats. And um, yeah, if you have any questions, please feel free to ask any of us. And um, what's the painting on there? What's that? What's the um, I'm not too sure. I think it's sort of just a filler for the space there so that we have two paintings to make it symmetrical. Um, so I don't really know what that is. If you'd like to go up to Sets on the stage full or what? Yeah. Do they change them as the people plays and such, right? Yeah. So Why are some of the seats on the center wedge of the first floor not cast iron? Now it's back down to around 750 or so for the capacity, but we can fit a lot of minor models. 
I guess there's very few cast iron seats on the first floor. I thought that those are back there. <laughs> yeah. Here's the original soundboard from 1879. Uh, front and middle, these are the original 1879 seats. Slightly different uh, because the tops and tips of it are painted more bronze color compared to the gold ones upstairs. We also do have these wooden seats on either side which were put in by the Weston family. Beth and I told you about right after the Tabers had it. And then in the back, those leather seats in not so great condition, those were put in by the Elks. Um, so at one time, it was just all of one type of seat upstairs and down. Um, but now today, we thought we could just mix all the seats together. And in case you didn't hear, all our set pieces on stage are all original. I uh, found two Februarys ago in 2019 just stored away on our third and a half floor. So we were able to get an expert to come in and help us take them and take the paint and fix them up a little bit. And she was able to tell us that um, they were all dated from 1879, 1888, and 1902 being our newest ones. In 1902, the Elks sort of just put all their set pieces away and everybody forgot about them until about two years ago. And so we were able to bring them out. We have about 17 full sets with over 100 pieces and a few more pieces stored upstairs we still need to clean out and bring down. And it was recently the subject of a New York Times article that got released uh, last week, um, all about our set pieces and the discovery of them. That's been drawing lots of attention to our opera house here. And on stage is one of our most prized possessions. Mm -hmm. It is the Navi Grand Piano, or the Horace Austin Warner Tabor Grand Navi Piano. It was purchased in 1880 from the Metropolitan Theater. Uh, before it was even called the Met. It is made out of Brazilian rosewood, mm -hmm. and it is nine feet long, and what? the exterior is all original. Uh, the interior has been redone a few times, so it can still be played. Um, and it's one of the items that Horace Taper had to auction away in 1893, and so it bounced around lots of different places, and a family in 2006 came to us and said, we think we have your piano. Wow. So, of course, it did end up being our piano, and we're very lucky to have it donate back to us and have it on our stage here. Where was it at? Um, it was stored away, and a family from Colorado Springs, I believe, uh, came in and told us they had our piano. Wow. <laughs> That's a story. Wow. Um, they had all the dating and um, certification papers and whatnot Serial to show us. more about the private
so this is where she would store a lot of her furniture. So she would sell antiques and things like that. And that's just what was for her. Oh, it's like, what they take bath where they got done or something? <laughs> like a milk bath or something, yeah. right? These are the dressing rooms. <laughs> so we have what we call acoustic service thing. Right. <laughs> now we just have speakers, so it's not quite as cool. So the reason why we call them third and a half is because they ignored half of the floor, so now it's kind of like third and a half. So it's kind of a sliding place where the basically yeah, yeah, it's in this building. It's just Wardrobe. super high up. There's about four inches of dust on everything, so that's where they were used to look. Is your buddy? <laughs> Yeah. Yes, we have. Okay, everyone. I hope that everybody can kind of sort of hear me and have a little bit of a spiel to go through. Um, so, right up here where the joys are missing and feeling, this is Houdini's trap door. Um, and so the story goes that the famous magician Houdini just stopped in here one evening before his magic performance, and he just started sawing up the floorboards, and no one stopped him because it's Houdini. Why would you? And so he cut his own personal trap door right here. Um, he would disappear down into the dressing rooms. We still have not found him to this day. Um, and so that is just what's left. And so right next to the trap door, he had a pipe installed right here. And that would act as a handle so Houdini could swing up and down from there. He was very agile. But it was a one-time magic show, and the trap door has been here ever since. Um, and so in this mummy case is not a mummy, unfortunately. But these are the boxing ropes that made up the boxing ring from when Jack Dempsey and John Sullivan boxed on stage. Now, they didn't fight each other, they fought separate opponents, but they were the most popular names on the cards, and so we just say Jack Dempsey and John Sullivan. Um, so these ropes wrapped around, and then these posts went up on the stage, and they just went at it, I suppose. Um, and so, yeah, there are eight or nine small rooms down here. The leading man has his own to the south, that way, and the leading lady has her own to the north, this way. Um, so if you'd like to look around down here at each of these individual rooms, you may, and then we're going to head back up the way we came. <laughs> This is very flammable. This is a strip that was added on, I think. This is the leading ladies' room, complete with high pressure laminated countertop. I found a blueprint on the wall that's kind of interesting. The renovation is going to involve the destruction of this original dressing room. That is the dressing room right there. And it looks like HVAC equipment is going to be installed there. they got a whole bunch of things they're going to do here. The north, north tenant space will, be, will remain intact. The center hallway into the opera house will remain intact. But they're adding a hallway that goes outside the building envelope to a tower that will contain an elevator, apparently. This is kind of interesting. The tuck pointers are reversing the bricks. They're flipping them over. So the side that used to face the inside of the building will now be facing out. That's a pretty clever way to eliminate wear. I wonder if this wall's done already. Well, no. Still got the ad on it. So somewhere back here they're going to put an elevator shaft in. It's 
an interesting downspout. It's open on one side. Well, they got all new flashings. They must have a new roof. <laughs>